Mahanayaka of the Ramanya sect, most venerable Napane Premasiri Thera, passes away. 2021 Appropriation Bill presented in Parliament. Wages of estate workers to be hiked to 1,000 rupees. Proposals for concessionary housing loans, simplified tax system to be introduced. Retirement age of private sector employees to be increased to 60 years. Foreigners to be allowed to purchase super luxury condominiums in Sri Lanka under several concessions from 2021. Production economy to be prioritized. Plans afoot to achieve a 6% growth while narrowing the budget deficit and decreasing debt burden. A statement from the Prime Minister in Parliament. Good evening and welcome. This is Prime Time News on TV1. For the News First team, I'm Jaima Ratnayaka along with our sign language interpreter for this evening, Brian De Cruz, joining us via Zoom video conferencing technology. Taking a look at your top story for the day. Mahanayaka of the Ramanya sect, Agga Mahapandita, most venerable Napane Pemasiri Thera, passed away this evening while receiving treatment at the Pera Didier Teaching Hospital. The most venerable Thera was aged 98 at the time of his demise. The most venerable Napane Pemasiri Thera, who rendered a yeoman service to the Buddha Sasana, hails from a learned Sangha generation. Ekanayaka Mudiyanse Lage Tikiri Bandara was born on the 30th of November 1922 in the Napana village, Pathadumbara, as the fourth child in a family of seven. He was ordained as Napane Pemasiri on the 8th of July 1933 at the Udumbara Ramaya in Hurikadua. Napane Pemasiri Thera, who received Upasampada in 1943, received his theological education at the Dharmodya Pirivena in Vellavatta and the Vidyananda Pirivena in Nitambua. In 1967, the Vidya Sagara Pirivena in Hurikadua was established by Most Venerable Napane Pemasiri Thera and he remained its director until his demise. The Most Venerable Thera was the recipient of many honours during his lifetime, including titles such as Sasana Sobana, Sasana Kirti Shri, Vinayacharya and Vinaya Visharada. The most venerable Thera also engaged in Dhamma dissemination overseas tours in countries such as China, Cambodia, Korea and Malaysia. In 2008, he was awarded the Agramaha Pandita Honorary Degree by the government of Myanmar in recognition of his religious service to the international community. The most venerable Thera held various posts at the Ramanya sect, including being a committee member of the Registrar and Adhikarana Nayaka of the Ramanya sect prior to being appointed as the 13th Mahanayaka of the Ramanya sect in the year 2012. Most venerable Napane Pemasiri Thera, one of the most learned bhikkhus in the history of the Sangha dynasty of Sri Lanka, was well known for his kindness and affection. His invaluable service towards the betterment of the Ramanya sect and the entire Buddhist community in general under his leadership for more than eight years will never fade away from the hearts of the people of this country. The remains of the most venerable Thero will be transported to the Vidya Sagar Pirivana tomorrow morning. The final rites will be conducted on Sunday, the 22nd of November, at the grounds of the Bandarnaik National School in Kundasale. The appropriation bill for the year 2021 was tabled in Parliament by Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa in his capacity as the Minister of Finance. What were the proposals put forward and how were the funds allocated for the year 2021? We are now joined by News First's Asoka Dias and Zulfik Farsan for a detailed report. 
Thank you, Jamal, and good evening to all our viewers. Good evening, Mr. Dias. Good evening, sir. So, the 75th budget of Sri Lanka, presented by Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's his 11th budget presented to the Parliament of Sri Lanka. Mr. Dias, what's your take when you look at the budget document? Uh, the most important thing is that uh, this budget is very much aligned with the policy document that uh, President Gotabe Rajapaksa presented to the people in 2019, the Vistas of Prosperity and Splendor. It is very much aligned to that. Of course, yes, we are undergoing a challenging period with COVID-19 situation, and then the world economy is at a challenging situation. But still, we have managed to align the budget with the policy document that the President proposed in 2019. So, Taking into consideration all that, this is a very, very progressive budget, I would say, in the outset. Indeed, uh, Mr. Dias. Now, uh, many of you might ask, uh, what did the Prime Minister present like several days ago in Parliament? That was the budget for 2020. Well, basically, according to our parliamentary correspondence, that's to keep in with the provisions of the law that a budget needs to be presented. Am I Yes. Uh, so, in now, 2020 is only the only year from 1948 onwards that an year went through without a budget. Now, we all know that November, the budget for the next year is presented in the parliament. In uh, last year, the presidential election was on the cards, so a budget was not presented by the Yahapalne government. And then uh, the new government came into operation, but then came the COVID. COVID. So there was no opportunity to pass the budget. And then the parliament was dissolved. And uh, the election process got delayed because of COVID once again. again. And there was no, technically, there was no budget per se for 2020. And that is the only year that w which went through without a budget in Sri Lanka. Indeed, Mr. Dias. Now, interestingly, now this budget presented by Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa. Uh, uh, in Parliament today is mainly targeting to benefit the low-income earners. It is not so. I, I, I would say that it is the benefits are offered across the, across board. the board. So uh, before we go into the proposals uh, made by the budget, let's first have a look at what the Prime Minister had to say in his opening comments to the Parliament. The 75th budget of post-independent Sri Lanka was presented by Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha in Parliament today. The budget, which aims at improving the economy through productivity-led development, strengthens President Gotabe Rajapaksha's national policy framework, vistas of prosperity and splendor. Irrespective of the economic standing of the country, irrespective of the challenges we are faced with, we must acknowledge that there is a paradigm shift in the world economy which moved forward with industrialization has now entered into a technology-driven economy. As policymakers, we must view this as a reason to move away from our outdated strategies and in developing the agriculture, industry and services sectors Technology infusion should be prioritized in accessing the integrated production and service processes. We are at a time when many countries have realized the geopolitical significance of our country. I believe that our neighboring India will be a powerful economy in the world over the next decade. I also believe China, together with several other Asian countries, will be amongst the five most powerful economies in the world. The high growth neighboring Asian market, which accounts for 60% of the global population and emerging economic zone. We should formulate our national policies with a long-term strategic vision, protecting our sovereignty to exploit the development opportunities that arise as a central hub in the new economic order of the world to both the conventional Western advanced economies and the powerful emerging Eastern economies. We must develop the Hambantota and Colombo ports together with the airports to be a center in the international commercial processes, expanding the domestic economic opportunities within a broad national vision. Our target is to maintain an inclusive growth rate of 6% over the medium term. 
Priority should be given to the maintenance of price stability, facilitating an annual inflation rate of around 5%, resulting in the control of cost of living, reducing the revenue expenditure gap of the government annually from 9% to 4% is one of the key milestones in the management of fiscal policy. In order to reach that milestone, it is essential to reduce the public debt from 90% of GDP to 70% and to minimize the risk in the debt composition caused by sourcing of foreign loans. It is required to reform the banking and financial sectors to ensure availability of credit and financing for the production process and associated transactions. We believe the central bank should have a new perspective on the monetary policy regarding money and liquidity management. Trade and production processes should be aligned so as to minimize the reliance on foreign imports in order to reduce the trade deficit. <laughs> Well, as the Prime Minister made those comments to Parliament, a series of proposals were made to benefit uh, all sectors across the board. We may be correct to say that to a certain extent, no one has been left behind in the Budget 2021. Mr. Dias, if we look at the Budget document, we see that the public sector as well as the private sector have benefited in all formats. Uh, one key area, uh, Zulfik, is the, uh, to a, they have encouraged private savings. Prime Minister has proposed as the Finance Minister to treat medical insurance, interest on housing loans, investment in government securities and shares of listed companies, incurred up to 100,000 per month as deductible ex expenditure in the calculation of personal tax. Now this is uh, a big package offered to, I would say, the middle class. In addition to that, uh, we've seen in the budget document that small and medium scale businesses are being given a boost, a much expected boost during these trying times, especially with COVID-19 uh, all over the place. In addition to that, vocational training has also been given top priority by this government. Now this is a very interesting area. We have to upskill people. Vocational training is an area that was neglected for decades. After uh, university entrance examination, the GCE A level examination, about uh, you know limited numbers, about 30 to 35,000 students get into the universities. What happens to the rest? Now this government is proposing to pay them if they are. You know, doing well, the course, mm -hmm. to my mind, it's about 4,000 rupees 4, per, per month, per month. Uh, are paid to them, encouraging them to skill themselves, which is a very interesting area. And then the, for the infrastructure, the government is not going to invest uh, again mm -hmm. uh, to buildings and so on and so forth. What they are trying to do is utilize the buildings that is already there in the periphery which are owned by the government, the gov various government institutions, to utilize them as vocational training institutes. That's right, Mr. Das. In addition to that, uh, these vocational training beneficiaries will also be entitled to concessionary loans as well in the long run when they perform well. And on that note, let's have a quick look at what the proposals are made through Budget 2021. Several concessions were provided to the general public among the budget proposals. The daily wage of plantation workers is proposed to be increased to 1,000 rupees from January 2021. A guaranteed price will be provided for rice, maize, kurakang, sesame and black gram. Proposals to amend the Agrarian Development Act No. 46 of 2000 to empower the district secretaries to direct the use of barren and abandoned agricultural land. Ban on importing ginger and turmeric to continue. Fertilizer for paddy will be provided free of charge, while fertilizer for other crops will be provided at a concessionary price of 1,500 rupees per stock. Three Porsche will be distributed to infants and pregnant mothers commencing from March 2021. 
1.5 billion rupees will be allocated to increase the production of 3 Porsche. 4G and fiber broadband coverage will be provided to every village while identified state lands will be vested with the Telecommunication Regulatory Commission to implement communication tower installations. Proposal to implement a loan scheme for low and middle income earners with an annual interest rate of 6.25% and a payback period of 25 years. Permission will be granted for non-executive office employees of the public service to engage in other jobs or employment after office hours. Compulsory retirement age expanded to 60 years. Proposal to introduce a contributory pension scheme for those engaged in foreign employment. Proposal to establish a shop in all Gramaniladari divisions targeting 25,000 female entrepreneurs from Samurdi families. Proposal to pay 2 rupees per dollar above the normal exchange rate for the foreign exchange remittances deposited by foreign workers. A monthly bursary of 4 billion rupees for students in the vocational education system. 3 billion rupees allocated to provide televisions for rural schools to watch Guru Gedara educational programs. Implementation of a new Samurdi Enterprise Development Loan Scheme with an annual interest of 7%. Simplify the approval and licensing process pertaining to the construction industry. All identified excavation centers to be assigned to the Road Development Authority. Legal action to be taken against those responsible for causing distress to ETI depositors. Proposal to extend concessions granted to the tourism sector under the refinancing facilities of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka until the 30th of September 2021. Steps to be taken to extend the marine drive up to Moratua. Plans to increase solar energy capacity added to the national grid to 1,000 megawatts. Identified deforested lands to be reforested with the assistance of the Sri Lanka Air Force. 20 billion rupees to be allocated as additional provisions to increase facilities for the tri forces. 2.5 billion rupees allocated to address special programs carried out by the police in order to strengthen public security. A considerable number of projects worth more than 6 billion US dollars show slow progress. The main deficiencies identified in the monitoring of project planning, feasibility, implementation is a deviation of the projects from national requirements and frequent cost and time escalations resulting in low returns. As such, an increase in foreign loans as well as the increase in debt services could be observed. Due to these expenditures, productive investments which could have been implemented at a lower cost are not adequately financed, adversely affecting the Treasury operations. Honorable Speaker, we have given priority to realign or reallocate those loan funds in line with the priorities identified in the Vistas of Prosperity and Splendor socio-economic development program. We acknowledge and appreciate the support of the relevant institutions. We have also allocated funds for priority sectors including improving the capacity of renewable energy and reforms in the finance and capital markets. Accordingly, the planned annual utilization of foreign loans as agreed with the World Bank, Asian Development Bank and Japan International Cooperation Agency alone is approximately 1.4 billion US dollars also, it is expected to obtain bilateral development loans of approximately 400 million US dollars. Since most of these projects have very little import content and requirement, I believe this measure will also have a positive impact on foreign currency management. Foreign financing will be sourced in line with the priorities and strategies of the development clusters. A key aspect of the public investment financing strategy is the utilization of domestic funds as much as possible to support the implementation of the development of national infrastructure providing access to the rural economy. <laughs> The value-added tax for companies with a turnover of more than 25 million rupees per month, except those operating in the banking, financial and insurance sectors, remains unchanged at 8%. A special goods and services tax is to be implemented to replace taxes on 
alcohol, cigarettes, telecommunication, gambling and gaming, and vehicles. Individuals and companies engaged in farming, including agriculture, fisheries and livestock farming, will be exempted from taxes over the next five years. Non-residents will be permitted to purchase super luxury condominiums utilizing foreign currency earnings. Proposal to provide a 50% tax concession for companies that are listed before the 31st of December 2021. Proposal to establish five fully-fledged plug-and-play techno parks in Gaul, Kurunagala, Anuradhapura, Kandy and the Batikalo district. Proposal to provide an additional allocation of 18 billion rupees for the expansion of maternity and child clinics. Strategic investment tax concessions to be provided for a period of five years for capital investments of over 25 million US dollars. Taxes on dried fish, Maldive fish and canned fish will be maintained at high levels. Solar panels funded by the Asian Development Bank and the Government of India will be provided to 100,000 low-income families. Ban the importation of batik products. Proposal to reduce import taxes levied on vehicle spare parts required for new production sectors. Usage of single-use polythene and plastics to be banned with effect from the 1st of January 2021. The contributory pension scheme proposed in 2012 for self-employed individuals to be implemented. 200,000 houses in rural areas will be provided with drinking water facilities. Proposals to construct 50,000 kilometers of rural roads. Steps underway to develop the Colombo Port City Special Economic Zone as an attractive business hub. Now, as we mentioned, the proposals uh, that you witnessed on screen uh, were made in the budget 2021. And there's one point that we must stress. This has been a long time coming, especially for the estate workers. That's a daily wage of 1,000 rupees. It's a big win for the estate sector. Of course. Uh, now, Zulfiq, 1,000 rupees is the key figure. I mean, that's the magical figure. They were agitating this and the estate uh, trade unions were working towards that, proposing this for a long period of time and now it is solid and it is mentioned in the budget that from January 2021, 1000 rupees is the wage for the estate workers. And on top of that, the Prime Minister very clearly explained that from 1992 onwards, the large uh, uh, state-owned uh, land were privatized and given to uh, the private companies mm -hmm. to manage and he questioned uh, whether these companies are doing enough and are they uh, you know making enough plans and are they are they having solid work plans to get maximum out of it to ensure that it gets what was required to the national economy and, uh, and the government says that in this budget that if these companies uh, do not come up with proper plans, they are looking at the possibility of bringing in new uh, legislature to uh, control the situation, which is, I would say, is a thing that was uh, proposed for a long period of time and finally it has come solid and it has come with this budget and with a uh, government with two-third majority and approval, this is a thing that they would push and push hard. Indeed, and not only that, even uh, expatriate workers are now going to be benefited through this budget with an additional two rupees per dollar that they send back home. As we all know that uh, foreign remittance has reduced and Sri Lankans working abroad find it uh, challenging with the uh, COVID-19 situation and the money that they earn there and send back home, it is it's quite uh, interesting and that the government has you know, agreed to the fact that they, the people who work there, work out there, work really hard, uh, should be respected and given some special uh, concession and offering these two rupees would benefit those families, especially 
uh, the people who are working in the Middle East, who are working under trying circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, the families will get more rupees to spend in Sri Lanka, which will be a great thing at this challenging period. Indeed, uh, because the Prime Minister stressed in Parliament that most of the people, most of the Sri Lankans who go for foreign employment to the Middle East are Sri Lankan women. The people who go there, the women who go there, are the ones who send back this foreign exchange to the country and they need to be given this benefit of an additional 2 rupee. Now what does the next year hold for us? What's the expenditure, what's the income that the government hopes to generate? Here's what the Prime Minister had to say in his closing remarks. <laughs> Honourable Speaker, this is a development budget presented to elevate an economy that has been shattered. It covers all sectors under a macroeconomic vision aimed at fulfilling the vistas of prosperity and splendour. This is a budget that will open up numerous special investment opportunities to our business community for the production of local goods and services under the competitive setting of the global economy. Producers of all scales should strive during the next three years to allow the local economy to competitively enter the global economy. The public sector should be encouraged in this regard. For the benefit of the country, I request all entrepreneurs to utilize the funds hidden locally or internationally in order to evade laws relating to taxes and foreign exchange. It is expected to make legal provisions to provide a tax pardon to entrepreneurs, thus utilizing funds for any investment facilitated by this budget under the payment of taxes amounting to 1%. The estimated government revenue for 2021 is 1.961 trillion rupees. The total government expenditure is 3.525 trillion rupees and as such the difference between the revenue and expenditure is 1.564 trillion rupees. It is planned to maintain the budget gap at 9% of the GDP since private investments which amount to 32.3% of the GDP in 2014 has decreased to 27.6% in 2019 and since it is required to provide a robust start by the government to revive the economic growth which had stagnated recently. I believe that we can manage this budget gap due to enhanced opportunities to reissue local and international currency denominated debt at maturity. Well, that was the Prime Minister's closing remarks after delivering the budget 2021. But what happens after the budget is presented in Parliament? Well, it's the customary tea party. But this time, Mr. Dias, it was somewhat different to other years. Exactly, exactly. This time, uh, before ending, winding up the budget speech, uh, the parliament uh, was adjourned and they went for tea. And this time, uh, well, although usually you find the media personnel running behind the uh, MPs, from both the government and the opposition to get their comment on the budget this time the media was not allowed in there were strict measures in place due to covid 19 and let's now have a look at what happened at the tea party
Well, that was footage of the customary tea party hosted in Parliament following the presentation of the budget. Now, before we hand it back to Jamal in the main desk, we would like to ask one thing from uh, Isidai's commitment. There must be, I mean, however much the proposals are good, there must be a lot of commitment from all stakeholders to ensure that these progressive measures are becoming reality in the ground level. If we could see the, uh, you know, the the warmth and the uh, comradeship and the and the uh, uh, the, uh, the mutual understanding that they had during the Tea Party in the mm -hmm. Parliament, I think it will not be difficult to take it through. Thank you, Mr. Das, for joining us on Primetime News here on TV1. And it's back to Jamal. Thank you, Zofik and Asoka Das, for bringing out that detailed and comprehensive report of the contents of Budget 2021. Moving on to more local news and the COVID-19 situation in the country. 404 COVID-19 infected patients recovered today, raising the total number of recoveries in Sri Lanka to 12,210. The total number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Sri Lanka, meanwhile, has risen to 17,831. 5,560 COVID-19 patients continue to receive treatment at hospitals across the island. The Ministry of Health noted that the death toll due to COVID-19 currently stands at 61. Three COVID-19 related deaths were reported yesterday. The disease is an 84-year-old woman and two men aged 70 and 75. According to the Department of Government Information, the woman had passed away at her residence. It has been revealed that the cause of the death is COVID-19 infection with diabetes. The 70-year-old resident of Colombo 10 died while being treated at the IDH and according to the Department of Government Information, the patient had suffered from chronic kidney disease and a stroke. The 75-year-old man who died upon admission to the National Hospital is a resident of Colombo 13. Among COVID-19, he was diagnosed with diabetes and congenital heart disease. Meanwhile, 231 of the 382 COVID-19 cases that were detected yesterday were from the Colombo district. 42 cases were from the Gampaha district, while 20 cases were reported from the Kalatra district. The National Operations Centre for Prevention of COVID-19 Outbreak announced that eight police officers, five members of the Police Special Task Force, 51 inmates at the Bogambra prison, and one inmate of the Valikata prison tested positive for the virus yesterday. Thereby, a total of 5,899 COVID-19 cases were reported in the Colombo district in the time span between the 4th of October and today. And that's a wrap of Prime Time News on TV1. For the news first team, I'm Zaymal Zafnaik, along with our sign language interpreter, Brian De Cruz. Take care, stay safe and good night.